Hello, I'm Sahil Rahman and this is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, a historic loss and damage fund was adopted at COP27, but will rich nations really compensate poor countries vulnerable to global warming, or is it just another empty promise? Also this week, Britain faces the sharpest fall in living standards on record, and the economic outlook is gloomy. Can the government's fiscal plan and austerity measures ease the country's pain? And FIFA has scored big with the Qatar World Cup, earning revenue of $7.5 billion. We explore the role of intellectual property in sports business. Welcome to the programme. It was one of the most contentious issues at the COP27 summit. Wealthy nations have long refused to compensate poor countries struggling to cope with the effects of climate change, fearing legal liability. But after more than three decades, diplomats from around 200 nations made a breakthrough and agreed to establish a loss and damage fund. The deal was a big win for vulnerable nations who bear the brunt of flooding and droughts, despite contributing far less comparatively to the carbon emissions that are causing global warming. Well, the fund would include contributions from developed nations and other public and private sources, like the international financial institutions. But full details of how it'll work and which countries will pay still need to be hashed out at next year's climate talks. And despite the breakthrough on climate finance, the summit failed to deliver on phasing out the use of fossil fuels. Madagascar is one of the world's poorest countries that's been ravaged by drought and successive cyclones and tropical storms. The UN has called the country's famine the world's first disaster induced by climate change. But many people disagree with that assessment, blaming poverty and poor governance instead. Nick Clark reports now from Erada in southern Madagascar. When crops consistently fail, you take what you can find. Who cares if normally only cattle eat cactus? And boiled up, it fills a gap for a while. The village is in a very bad situation. No food, no water. That is the biggest issue in this region. We need help to solve this because people are living on cactus. That's all there is. In the regional capital of Ambuvombe, a woman has brought her seven-month-old daughter to hospital after she became seriously ill with diarrhea and vomiting. Every day we eat what we pick up along the road like red cactus fruits. I'm exhausted and I just can't breastfeed my baby because I'm so hungry. I have no milk in my breast. If there is no food, we just drink water and sleep. Here in the malnutrition units, they're preparing for a big influx in December and January. We're going into what is called the, the lean season. So it's a time when it's very difficult for families to grow their own food, harvest their own food. There's a lack of rainfall. We expect cyclones to start appearing sometime in the new year. And so this is the time when families are really forced to forage for food. And so there are estimates that around 480,000 children between now and February, uh, April of next year may need to be treated for uh, acute malnutrition. It's not that the food isn't there. In Ambu Vombe's market, you wouldn't think times are hard, but these goods are mostly imported into the region and spiraling prices push them well out of reach of the poor. Hundreds of thousands across Madagascar depend on outside support from the likes of WaterAid and the World Food Programme. Here, the government is delivering fertiliser and seeds to farmers, and they need all the help they can get. But if there's no rain, no amount of fertiliser will help. Now, the UN called the famine here back in 2021 the first famine caused in the world solely by climate change. But a lot of people disagree with that. They say it's down to poor governance and to poverty. The truth, I think, it's a combination of all three. Climate change that's wreaking havoc around the world, causing devastation here in Madagascar. Poverty, 90% of Madagascans live in poverty. And poor governance inside and outside the country. For the people, though, it's all irrelevant. For them, these times are simply known as kere, the hunger. 
To discuss all of this, I'm joined now from Rotterdam in the Netherlands by Patrick Verkoyen. Patrick is the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Centre on Adaption. Good to have you with us uh, on Counting the Cost. Developing countries have been fighting, what, for nearly three decades now. What change has happened to allow this situation to evolve right now? Well, I think the politics has changed uh, uh, so hell. For 30 years, indeed, developing countries have fighted for moral justice to end the climate apartheid regime where the global north was polluting and the global south was suffering. I think in, um, at COP27, developing countries made very clear this has to end, and they were very unified in their, um, in their stance. I think the defining factor in why there is now this global fund on loss and damage is that the European Union um, uh, accepted this sort of uh, fundamental moral injustice. They were the first ones to basically say, OK, we're willing to compensate for the losses which you experience, but what we need from you in return is a strong commitment to the 1.5 Celsius goal, which is that the world cannot warm up more than 1.5. So there was this sort of package deal in Sharm el Sheikh. Was it enough? Time will tell. And indeed, as you say, you know, about the compensation, it was a, a hard fought acknowledgement of climate damage and who bears the responsibility to pay for the repair. I mean, whatever the cost, uh, will it be enough for developing countries to say justice has been achieved when we know sometimes the physical materialisation of money in the pot is when success can actually be seen? But that is precisely uh, the, the right point, indeed. I think it's a fundamental breakthrough that the fund is now there. But let's look at the details. The negotiation dictated that in the next 12 months, the fundamental modalities of the fund still needs to be operationalized. How much money? Who pays? Where is the money going to come to? I mean, that's all still up for grabs, so to say, as part of the next 12 months conversation but that we have a fund right now is basically a matter of trust. In a sense, the Global North have now promised to deliver this. But as you said, in reality, in the last years, we also have seen that the Global North is not really reliable in delivering what they have promised before. Take the Paris Agreement commitment. The Global North had promised $100 billion a year flowing from the North to the South. How much is flowing today? $80 billion a year. So we're still far short. And I'm not necessarily optimistic, uh, quite frankly, in this regard, uh, Sohel, uh. that this money will flow, at least that it will flow at the scale required, but also it will flow at the speed speech which is really determined by the climate crisis. It's funny you should talk about sort of who pays and who benefits because that in, indeed has also been a controversial issue uh, as well because China is considered for example as a developing country. Will countries eventually agree on that or as to who will end up uh, benefiting from it because of course Oxford University researcher uh, Benito Muller uh, said it might just be what he described as a placebo fund. Well, 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 let's zoom out for a little bit. I mean, what have we seen in the last 10 years? Another fund was uh, negotiated, was announced with big fanfare. 20 years ago, the adaptation fund was being put on the table, requested, demanded by the developing nations. They say, you know what, we're suffering. Someone needs to pay up for the adaptation cost in infrastructure, in food security, um, in youth and jobs. Well, how much money has been put on the table in the last 20 years in total? under $1 billion a year. But that's, of course, a big number. But what are the needs for the developing world? Just Africa alone needs $52 billion a year. So there are funds already in the UN system which were fought for for many, many years, which were agreed to for many, many years, but which are underfunded. The okay, big Pat risk Patrick, now can I, can is I just jump the, in there, yeah. Patrick, then? Because if we talk Please. about UN funds, how, how influential are the international financial institutions that are also now, in theory, going to be to, contributors to this? How do they change that equation? Well, that was one of the sort of the breakthrough moments, the, the real historical uh, outcome of um, COP27, the climate summit in Egypt, was that for the first time, 
the multilateral development banks, the World Bank, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and the IMF were front and center. What did parties agree to? They need reform. Why? Because climate risk translates into financial risk, into macroeconomic risk. So they now is an agreement that the World Bank will reform its business model, that it will not just be traditional development, but climate smart development, which means that every dollar, every euro, which goes from the World Bank into the field will now have this climate lens provided to it. At the end of the day, uh, um, it is not about the millions on the table. At the end of the day, it's quite frankly not even about the billions on the table. It's about shifting the trillions. And for that, the finance institutions which we have designed since the Second World War need to become fit for purpose. World Bank needs okay. to become fit for purpose for the challenges of today. And that was one of the fundamental outcomes of COP27. Uh, Patrick, very briefly then, yes, if in, in, in an ideal world that the finances would work in a way that could help developing countries and, and continents like Africa and parts of Asia. But then you also have those issues of conflict. And we're seeing now, obviously, Ukraine and Russia and how that's impacting not just on Europe, but on the rest of the world. So therefore, Germany, for example, is now burning more coal. Britain is talking about it. These are when you might say a spanner is thrown into the cogs, the wheel of development uh, and sustainability. You, nobody can predict it, but it does happen, doesn't it? How long do you think it's going to take for, you might say, the world to readjust if and when peace is declared between Russia and Ukraine? Yeah, so and, and indeed, what we see now is these fundamental system shocks. You mentioned Ukraine, but let's also not forget the recovery uh, from COVID, which still is hampering many economies across the, uh, the globe. And on top of that, there is the climate crisis. What for me is fundamental is to realize we can talk about reparation, recovery, but would it not be better to put our investment, particularly in the low carbon pathway, to stick to the mitigation targets which we have promised since 2015. That was, in my world, a big loss from Sharm el Sheikh. We didn't really increase our ambition. What we promised last year, we would increase our ambition to reduce our carbon footprint. We didn't deliver. What we did deliver is a fund without money in it. I mean, is that enough? Certainly it isn't. On your question in terms of how long will it take? Well, obviously, the conflict of Ukraine will lead to even more fiscal constraints. But at the same time, it's not just government resources what we'll have to come up and put on the table for the climate recovery. It is particularly mm. the private sector needs to come in. Patrick Verkuchen uh, from the Global Centre on Adaption, joining us from Rotterdam. Thanks for joining us on Counting the Cost. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Britain's economy is in recession. It's expected to push half a million people out of work and it's forecast to shrink even further next year. The bleak outlook comes as the country battles decades high inflation, eroding incomes for millions of people, and now Britons will have to tighten their belts even further. The government wants to balance its public finances and has announced a $66 billion fiscal plan, which includes tax increases and public spending cuts. The plan means that more British people will pay higher rates of income tax and higher energy bills. It also includes a substantial increase to windfall taxes on the profits of oil and gas companies and additional investment in schools and the National Health Service. However, big reductions in public spending were pushed back until after the next election in two years. Jeremy Hunt, the British Chancellor's plan, could inflict more pain on millions of British people who face the biggest hit to living standards since records began. The Office for Budget Responsibility predicts household incomes to drop by the most in six decades, down by 7% over the next two years. That's worse than what the government's spending watchdog had forecast in March. The fall would wipe out the past eight years of improvements in incomes as the rising cost of living eats into wages. That'll effectively turn the clock back to 2013. 
To discuss the impact of the fiscal plan on the British people and what it means for the country's finances, I'm joined now from London by Patrick Perrett green Patrick is the Chief Executive Officer at PPG Macro. Good to have you with us uh, on Counting the Cost, uh, Patrick. I mean, the Prime Minister has set out a very bleak economic forecast uh, that he's presented to the nation and partly blamed it on the fallout after the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. How justifiably can he continue to use these issues as an excuse for the woes that the United Kingdom ex is experiencing right now? Well, I, th I think it's really quite legitimate. I mean, both, I, you know, both, both of our wartime events, I mean, I mean, requiring sort of the sort of actions one requires during war but of you know, significant government action. And we shouldn't forget that many other economies are suffering similar difficulties. Um, he's probably overlaid the grimness um, as a deliberate tactic to sort of overcompensate for that brief nightmare of um, what I call the cluster trust. And um, so it's, 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 if you, it's sort of the game of mm. make everything grim, hopefully things can be better. Well, let's talk about that Liz Trust scenario and obviously Jeremy Hunt's opinion of the country's finances and how to uh, better the United Kingdom financially are very different to what Liz Truss had proposed with her former Chancellor as well. I mean, how much of these proposals that we're hearing now are a repair job and how much uh, of it is there to reassure investors that they should be putting their money in the UK and not to worry, there won't be any more policy U-turns. I, I mean, as I said earlier, I think there's a deliberate move. I mean, we shouldn't forget what Rishi Sunak's original policies were when he was Chancellor, and they were pretty austere. And there's probably been a bit of an extra swing to reinforce that credibility. And that credibility has been, um, has benefited investors. So if we look at um, UK government bond yields, they're back to where they were um, at the beginning of September. And actually, they are considerably lower compared to, um, if you look at bond yields and US Treasury yields, are actually much higher. So the UK government bond market has had a stellar performance. And also look at the pound. Um, the pound is back at 121 from that horrible overnight low, about 103 and a half. And actually, the UK equity market is one of the few major global stock markets that is up year to date. So investors seem to actually have really loved the credibility of the government. I mean, you just talked about the fact that Rishi Sunak's uh, opinion before, uh, as he was when he was Chancellor, was austere, and that Jeremy Hunt's actions have made the country you know, actually further into the sort of austerity bracket. I mean, what's your opinion now about the way that the, the government is talking about budget holes, uh, increased taxes and spending cuts? I mean, what sort of noises are you hearing from your colleagues in the financial industry about well, whether this really is the know. right balance? I mean, certainly as far as the electorate's concerned, I mean, obviously the Tories are in, in bad shape in terms of the polls. But actually, the electorate likes the truth. And they're actually, they've probably overdone the downside, I think. And, for example, like earlier on this week, we had the latest borrowing numbers. They were much, much lower than was forecast, about £7 billion lower in the month of October. So um, there is fiscal room there. I mean, I, and I think over time, we'll see less austerity. And there are various technical factors of why the, I, mean, it, it, I, I don't really go for this story about the budget hole. A, a lot of it is sort of balance sheet related, because so much of, of the debt is, of our debt, 25% of our debt is inflation bonds. But that does, money does not have to be paid until those bonds mature. And most of those bonds only mature in about 20 to 30 years time. So I, I think going forward, the world economy is clearly struggling, but I think we're actually going to find there's more fiscal room on the upside going forward. So they've had to swing the pendulum too far to sort of redress the effects of trust. But I think that pendulum has swung too far. And if anything, we, we might get some better news going the other way as we go into 2023 and 24. Let's talk about 2023, because there is a suggestion and, and potential for energy bills to rise in the spring. I mean, how long do you think Jeremy Hunt um, or Jeremy Hunt's ideas have got to prove themselves uh, as the right way forward in a country that seems to be ever present using the word poverty uh, across all of the social uh, classes? 
Well, I mean, I, you can see that, again, I would say that I was just reading about the rise of Australian food bank usage earlier on this morning. Um, it is tough, but one of the things I would say about the government's policies is actually they're very progressive. And I think when we get to the next year's energy bills, well, we've already, they, they could be much lower if actually we look what's happened to global gas prices and how the world has adjusted to um, the war in Ukraine. So, I, I, it's and, and and I think we'll see a more progressive policy. So rather than people like me getting a rebate when I don't really need it, um, I think the policies with the next round will be more directed towards exactly those people who need it most. We've often heard in the last few months that Britain wants to be a leader, not a follower. And yet within the, uh, the G7, it's often described now as having one of the smallest uh, growth economies within uh, that large, rich group of countries. It's not a position that the United Kingdom really wants to be in, but it's going to be a very difficult position to get out of and to convince your G7 and G20 partners that you are a force to be reckoned with economically. You know, I, oh, I think we are clearly still a force to be reckoned with economically, just because, I mean, if we actually look at, when we're talking about the technical details about GDP growth, German GDP is barely back to where it was. I mean, we're only, and we are barely back to where we were as well. So I think far too much is made about GDP. Um, and, you know, there is an awful lot of what, look at the, what the Ukraine, what the UK has done is with regards to Ukraine, apart from the US, it's been the single largest donor and of, of equipment and money. So I think that the UK will continue to um, have its weight. So I, I mean, I think there's, a, there's another side of the equation that obviously just because of the very nature of the UK, it tends to get um, an excessive amount of attention relative to its importance in the global economy as a whole. Well, we'll see what happens uh, certainly in the coming months. For the moment, Patrick Perrick green thanks so much for joining us from London. Great to be with you. The World Cup is in full swing and football's governing body FIFA says it's earned $7.5 billion in revenue from taking the tournament to Qatar. That's an increase of more than $1 billion compared with the tournament in Russia four years ago. The earnings were boosted by an increase in sponsorship deals including Qatar Energy and telecommunications firm Aridu. FIFA invests most of its earnings back into the development of football. Most of its income comes from selling TV broadcast rights for the World Cup. FIFA also draws in cash through the licensing of its brand. Well, the World Cup's important brand assets, such as the names of the event, the trophy, the official emblem, and even the mascot attract global recognition. So how can their economic value be protected? Al Jazeera's Osama bin Javid explores the role of intellectual property rights in sports finance with Darren Tang, the Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization. FIFA in the World Cup, right, is very connected as well. But first of all, there's technology in, 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 the, in the World Cup. There's a lot of brands in the World Cup. There's broadcasting rights, right? And all of that combined to, to make and help FIFA, right, to be able to, 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 be able to monetize uh, the event. Uh, already, uh, the broadcasting rights from the FIFA World Cup uh, will be $3 billion. And, and IP rights in sports globally right, uh, reached $50 billion uh, two years ago. So there's a lot of connection between IP and sports that people don't realise. So where does Qatar come into all of this? Uh, because it is the first time that the Cup is happening in the Middle East. Has Qatar been working towards intellectual property, towards a knowledge-based economy? Well, you know, Qatar, Qatar is, 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 uh, has an ambition right, to be a technology and R&D centre as well. And just earlier this year, one of my senior colleagues visited Qatar and signed an MOU with a couple of universities, you know, Hamid bin Khalifa University, Qatar University, right? To see how we can bring IP training to the university graduates. Why? Because as Qatar diversifies the economy and as it connects to the world, right? Uh, we need to support young Qatari innovators, entrepreneurs, creators, researchers, right? And IP is their tool that they need to use to be able to, to bring their ideas to the market. But intellectual property is not just about big companies. Let's find out how the organisation promotes it among small enterprises. We want IP not just to work for big companies, but we want it to work better for SMEs and startups. Our priorities for the next five years will be on women, youth and uh, small medium enterprises. We are, we are focusing on creating projects that create impact on the ground, that bring people and IP much closer together. So for example, right, we've just launched a project in the Petra region of Jordan to support 35 women entrepreneurs uh, in that region 
to use IP as their, as, as their ally, to use IP as part of their business journey. We've just launched a project last year in Uganda, right, to support uh, women entrepreneurs in Uganda, to use IP to skillfully as part of their business strategy, to be able to market brand and, you know, and package their products. So we're trying to really bring IP to the ground and create projects right, where people feel that IP is part of their lives as well. We're trying to break this stereotype right, that IP is only for big companies and not for SMEs. We're trying to break this stereotype that IP is only for the global north and not for the global south. And by the way, 7 in 10 IP right now comes from Asia, Middle East, Africa and Latin America. So the world has changed. And that's our show for this week. Do get in touch with me by tweeting me at so underscore ramen and do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sihil Rahman and from the whole team, thanks very much for joining us. The news is next here on Al Jazeera.